Welcome to Loyola Marymount University's Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles 2008 Urban Lecture Series. This is a lecture series that we started 10 years ago at the university. It's interdepartmental dialogue uh, for many students and the community. Uh, we have government leaders, business leaders, civic leaders to come and discuss the major issues facing our city. Today we have a panelist of commentators of Los Angeles, people who have continued the civic dialogue for various years here in our great city. Today we have Val Savala from KCET Life and Times. We also have with us Aaron Aubrey Kaplan, a LA Times reporter and one-time columnist for the Los Angeles Times. In addition, we have Gustavo Arellano, a OC Weekly reporter. They will be discussing a, uh, all kinds of issues facing our community today. Uh, for more information, uh, go to our website, www.lmu.edu backslash CSLA. Welcome to the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles Urban Lecture Series. Today we have some guests to do a lot of uh, commenting on Los Angeles, Southern California, Orange County. Um, we have our guest from the uh, beginning to my far left, Aaron Aubrey Kaplan, who began working full time as a journalist in 1992 for the Times and for a short time for the section called City Times, which didn't last very long, sure where she continued covering the Crenshaw District, South Central, wherever that is, events affecting LA's disparate black communities. She also worked for the New Times Los Angeles and LA Weekly, where she wrote a column called Cakewalk, a widely uh, anthologized author, Kaplan's articles have appeared in the London Independent, The Guardian, Salon.com, The Crisis, Newsday, Contemporary Art Magazine, The Utney Reader, Black Enterprise, and I can go on and on. She has completed a book, uh, it's an essay collection entitled Views and Blues from the Edge, Dispatches from, black, from a Black Journalista. So that is Erin Aubrey Kaplan. Next to her is Gustavo Arellano, who is a staff writer with the OC Weekly, an alternative newspaper in Orange County, which kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but we'll leave it at that. It exists. Okay. It really does. <laughs> and he's also a contributing editor to the Los Angeles Times opinion uh, editorial pages, or the op-ed pages. He's a familiar presence in Southern California radio as a frequent guest on liberal and conservative talk shows. He's a little confused. He doesn't know whether he's a liberal or a conservative. Um, where he discusses local and national issues. I think you were on the radio this morning, weren't you? I was you? on Kevin and Bean, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, you heard me. Yeah. <laughs> Some people did. Arellano uh, also writes the column, Ask a Mexican, a nationally syndicated <laughs> column and winner of the 2006 Association of Alternative Weeklies Award for Best Column, in which he answers any and all questions about America's spiciest and largest minority. Mm -hmm. So if you have a question that you've ever wondered about a Mexican, this is the guy that answers them. Like my first question would be, why do Mexicans wear shirts like that or something like that? Because we like to shop at the thrift store. Okay. $15, very nice. That's, that's high for a thrift high. store. You got ripped off. We dressed up today. Okay, I okay. Yeah, this is okay. my dress shirt, come on. Okay. Ask a Mexican, which will be published in a book form by Scribner Press. It was, it was already published. Oh, it has been published. That's old. Okay. It has been a subject of uh, press coverage in the Los Angeles Times, Detroit Free Press, San Antonio Press, uh, even in uh, Mexico City. He's been on the Today Show, The Situation Room with uh, Tucker Carlson. He's been on Nightline, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporations, The Hour. You, you name it, he's been on it, including the Colbert Report. That must have been fun. Fun. Uh, Arellano's commentaries on Latino culture appear regularly on National Public Radio's Day to Day, the Latino USA program. Again, the, I, I can go on about all the different uh, shows that he's been on. He, he was a finalist for the 2005 Maggie Beck Show, excuse me, the 2005 Maggie Awards Best Public Service Series, and, and uh, has done all kinds of different, uh, win, won all kinds of different awards. Uh, Ariana was also a finalist for the 2005 Penn USA Literary Award for Journalism for his profile on the disabled Latino veteran of the Iraq War. And he, of course, he lives in Orange County, specifically in Anaheim. Uh, and also with us, very good friend for a long time, is uh, Val Sabala, who's been an anchor and is currently a 
Uh, she anchored is something that we're going to talk uh, quite a bit about, KCET's signature series, Life and Times, which aired Monday through Friday on KCET. Life and Times was an award-winning local news magazine offering viewers in-depth stories on politics, health, education, uh, growth, government, you, you name it, uh, Life and Times talked about it. Uh, how many, uh, I think you won all kinds of Emmy awards, including the Best Public Affairs Series, and all kinds of different awards. They were on for 16 years, and unfortunately, the last show was so December, yeah, 28th, December 28th. Came to uh, a close. Came to a close. Uh, she's won, let's see. She served as a reporter, co-host, documentary producer, and executive producer. Her work has garnered 10 LA Area Emmy Awards, six Golden Mics, an Avance Award from the Hispanic Americans for Fairness in Media, honoring journalists for longevity and integrity in broadcasting. She was also named one, one of the 100 Most Influential Latinos by Hispanic Business Magazine. She's also a trustee on the board of the Mount St. Mary's College, and she has served as keynote speaker, MC, moderator, and yeah, blah, again, blah, blah. I can go on and yeah, on and on and on. And on. <laughs> uh, she did receive a master's in journalism from American University in DC and a BA in Latin American studies from Yale University. Uh, she really wanted to come to LMU, but she couldn't afford it, so <laughs> she, went, she went to Yale. Okay, so we got three people who are very well known in Southern California commentary. They've covered Southern California. They've really uh, ha have been writing quite a bit about it. Um, unfortunately, we only have Erin for about uh, 45 minutes. So we're really going to focus on her a lot at the first 45 minutes. And as soon as we get rid of her, then we're going to show a little clip. We're going to show a clip uh, about life and time so we can talk about that and then talk uh, uh, quite a bit to uh, our two remaining guests. But uh, Aaron, mm. you constantly talk about really the black experience in LA, mm -hmm. growing up in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And you talk a lot about Inglewood, which yeah. is one of our, our neighboring cities. Yes. And talk a little bit about just the transition you've seen in Inglewood, because in our class we've been talking a lot about demographic shift, oh, yeah. and of course, uh, all the different uh, multicultural Los Angeles, but I always always talk to students about in the 1960 census of Inglewood, there were only 29 blacks counted. Yeah. Not 29%, 29. 29. Yeah. It was sure. a white city yeah. that then became vastly majority African American, mm -hmm. but now it's majority Latino. I don't know if it's majority, it's right at the... No, it's majority it? Latino. Oh, thank you for informing me. Uh, okay. Maybe you should walk around Inglewood a little bit more. <laughs> I walk every day around Inglewood. I walk my dogs for an hour. Um, well, um, yeah, Inglewood is one of those, I think, a very interesting place in Southern California because let it me, is. You know, let me ask, tell the students, we're using a new mic system, so yeah. if you have a difficult time hearing us, let me know, and we'll try to figure something out. But Erin, yeah. please. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, Inglewood is one of those, I think, a fascinating place right now because it's, um, it is one of those places like South LA, but South, South LA is much kind of bigger and more diffuse. So Inglewood is, a, you know, like, like Beverly Hills or Compton, it's its own city, it's pretty small. But it is really rapidly changing from, as you say, it's not majority Latino, but the government oh, no, right. and uh, the, the folks who run Inglewood are majority African American, I think, yeah. the, the elected officials. So it's very much like Compton in the sense that, you know, which Compton underwent the same thing. Compton is a different economic uh, uh, kind of picture. It's poorer. Inglewood uh, is nominally middle class. Mm. So there are different tensions there uh, about um, who's moving into the neighborhood sort of thing. Um, but it's interesting, I was just saying today to somebody that um, Inglewood is, um, we talk a lot these days about the split between the black middle class and the black poor, and the black poor all live in Compton and South LA and the middle class is left. But really, most black people, I, this is my anecdotal you know, kind You're of You're a journalist, you don't have to have yeah. data, go ahead. Right, <laughs> but, but most African Americans are living sort of in between that. Like, in Inglewood, it's pretty middle class, but you're very close to the violence and the poverty that, um, I mean, it's right, up, it's right on Crenshaw Boulevard. So most of us are tr trying to sort of um, uh, live a middle class existence, but are very, very much aware, of sort of living also in the middle of a lot of the problems, you know, we all know about the gang problems. Inglewood has a really high, I hate to say this, but um, I think the county of, the city of Los Angeles has around 40,000 gang members. Inglewood is, 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 unless I'm mistaken, I heard a, a a police officer in, in Inglewood say there was close like like twenty thousand in, uh, in, in a city that size that's nearly impossible. Yeah, I would find that hard to believe. Hundred ten thousand yeah, people, yeah. but um, um, I would say that this is very hard to to 
say it in a short, shorthand way, but um, black people are fine with the demographic change, and they're totally panicked about the demographic change. They are, and that, what I mean is like on my block, I'll just take it very small, my block, a lot of you know, black people, most of them are older. You don't see a lot of young families moving in who are African American, they tend to be Latino. But there's also a few families on the block who've, who are Latino, have been there as long as the black people. And I'll give you an example. There was recently a family that moved into, the, moved into my neighborhood, and because of the foreclosure crisis, we have a lot of, suddenly a lot of empty houses. Um, we're being impacted by that. A new family moves in, they're Latino. Uh, they don't speak to anyone. And the person most upset about this is a Latino neighbor on the other side who's been, been here a long time who thinks these people are unfriendly and doesn't understand why. And so he, you know, it, it's, it's, it's um, uh, he's in our community. <laughs> and, um, and so he feels sort of like, um, well, you know, he, and he's sort of upset with the change too. Not because the people are Latino, but because they're new and the block is changing. And so um, uh, it's, and, and personally, I, I, I feel, I, I have no issue at all with the demographic change, but in a bigger sense, what it means for black people is losing space. That's the best way I can describe it. Um, it's not personal, but the way that it comes out, that it's expressed in the media most of the time, or what the media picks up on is the Mexicans are taking over. Um, I feel like, you know, I go to my school and people speak Spanish and they don't speak to me. And what that really is expressing is a whole history of frustration with needs not being met. Mm -hmm. And this all comes up against the demographic change. And now there are really a lot of layers to this that really have not been explored uh, um, in a nuanced kind of way. And unfortunately, I have to say, amongst African American leaders and politicians and people like that, they're terrified of talking about it. They're terrified of talking about it, um, partly because it's just something they've never taken leadership on, and also because they're looking ahead and seeing their constituency is changing, and they don't want to offend Latinos. So as a result, we don't have a lot of high-level talk about what's really going on. But, but you write about it. Tell I do write about some it. Some of the stories that you've written about this. Um, I should also mention to the students that her father has been someone who's been heavily engaged in multicultural issues yeah. for many years. He was talking about this before a long it was cool to talk about this. Well, my, I mean, right. he's been talking about it so long, he knows Dr. Singleton <laughs> from, from whenever. Where is Dr. Singleton? But they were... Yeah, yeah. The, right. Uh, he, he has been involved in those things a really long time. And, and what, what he will say is that um, everybody always wants to do an ethnic coalition, but they never work. And there are reasons for that, but you know, we'll set that aside. But um, I think I'll just cite one thing I wrote about uh, that's related to the demographic change. I actually went to, you remember the big immigration rally that was downtown about, was it two years ago now? 2006. Sure. Okay. Uh, oh, six? Yeah, March. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, some of us remember it a little bit more. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, I went down there, you know, just to, to see what, what was going to happen, what, was, what, was, what it was all about. And I remember driving to, to downtown, driving towards the march, and South LA was sort of empty. It's like the, it had the day off. And there were, it, it was really, it started to hit me that, that you know, how, how deep that change was. I mean, without the Latinos, you know, out and about, there were like a few forlorn-looking black folks walking around, you know, and I just thought, it, it started to hit me then, when I actually got to the march, when I actually found a parking space and actually got in the mix, it was really overwhelming. I mean, in a literal way, in a way that had just been sort of in my head, like, yes, this change is happening, yes, it's rapid, yes, Latinos outnumber, you know, African Americans, but I really felt very, um, um, I don't know, sort of marginal in a way that I hadn't felt before. And I was just, um, there's an old blue song that said, I feel so unnecessary. And that's what I felt like in that march. It was really fascinating, and the energy was amazing, but I just felt like, uh, I really felt viscerally that change um, and the future of LA. And I really kind of started to feel panicked, like, what is the future of LA and how do I fit into it? Mm -hmm. I think for a lot of black people, that's the question. There's a lot of talk, and you know, uh, there's almost a, new, a slogan, the new LA. And there's a great deal of anxiety amongst the black population here, which has never been very big, but well, where do we fit into the new LA? Um, where do we get jobs? Uh, where do, wh what is our role, really? Our, what's our civic role in this new Los Angeles? Yeah, but the, where is the leadership that gives voice to that African American frustration because I get a there, sense there I, I get a sense from a lot of middle class mm -hmm. African Americans mm -hmm. that you know, they're um, I can talk to them mm -hmm. and we're different 
Mm -hmm. you know, and, and they're not necessarily sharing that frustration of African Americans mm -hmm. uh, because they're safer. They have jobs, they, they have options. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Mexican immigrants moving into neighborhoods are moving into poor African American right. neighborhoods, displacing, causing higher rents, et cetera. Right. How, how, you know, who gives them that voice? Well, that's, well, there Do is no one. Do you see your, your responsibility to I write suppose, a little bit about that? I mean, that? you know, it's funny, like I said, I, you know, I live in a neighborhood that's not exactly poor, not, exa not exactly upper class, so I'm actually in the middle of that, that transition. The folks you're talking about live in places where that transition is just not happening. Mm -hmm. So it does not, they don't feel it does not impact them. But truly, this is, this is not just an issue of the poor and the middle class. This, um, I hear a lot of middle class people who will say, not to you, <laughs> but they will say to other black people that where they are, like if they're in the public sector, uh, they feel they feel a pressure. They feel they feel um, uh, not misplaced by the Latino change, but they're nervous about it. Maybe they're not losing. You know, they're not seeing their neighbors change, or they're not seeing they're not losing their jobs. But they feel it's just a matter of time. So tell me about the most controversial article you've written that got the response from either African Hate American. You mean on this issue? Or on any issue. You know something, I, I don't remember, I, I remember the most vicious piece of hate mail I got, although I can't remember what the article was. It could have, you could almost pick anything. Um, I, I don't know what the article was, but I, I never forget this uh, uh, letter I got from a man who claimed to be a doctor, so he was, you know, and he said he was white, and he said, he said, you shouldn't even be writing about black people. Black people, in my estimation, have nothing to contribute to the world. Mm. They're backwards people from a continent that's never contributed anything to the world. Um, and he said, this is just my empirical observation. This is just, you know, I'm not saying it personally, but from what I, but you know, I, I don't see the point. I don't see the point of anybody taking any interest in Africans anywhere. Yet and he, it was read, like, it was yet like he signed, read your article. Respectfully signed whoever. Doctor whatever. Doctor so-and-so. And that kind of stunned me because it wasn't, it wasn't the emotional kind of screed you tend to expect. Right. It was kind of chilling. I mean, this could have been a fake letter, right? It was an right. email. But I still, the way, the way that he put it in a very sort of logical way uh, really um, uh, just kind of stopped me. And, um, uh, and it just kind of reminded me of, of like, you know, 19th century sort of theories about racial inferiority, uh, the way he put it. Um, and so, um, I, I, you know, like, like Gustavo, I write columns for the LA Times, and for a while I was actually a weekly columnist in opinion, and those definitely got me the most hate mail, because the more visibility you yeah, get, the more yeah. people, you know, um, uh, write you. But um, I think the, res the article that man was responding to was something very, it wasn't controversial at all. It was just the fact that I was bringing it up, mm -hmm. that I was um, uh, giving sort of a prominent space to something black, that's what it was. Um, when I, I used to write for the LA Weekly, Gustavo and I have many parallels, but I used to write for the Alternative Press. And, uh, but the minute I went to the LA Times as a columnist, people didn't want me there. And they really thought it was sort of a waste of real estate to have somebody black talking about other people who are black. It was like, why? Talking about black issues. No, they were just, they really like, why? What's the point? And it, was, and it kind of, like I said, really uh, it's stuck in my mind the most. So was there ever a, a uh, article or a portion of an article that you've written for the Times where you were told, no, nah, that the editor said. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah? yeah. So what, what would one of those subject matters be? Um, it, it, it's, that's really interesting. Um, a lot of the stuff that will be called into question was sort of like interpretation. I, I'll give you an example. Um, if I were to say a phrase like, um, um, uh, institutional racism. An editor would say, "What is that? How can you prove it? Prove it to me." Um, there, you know, an, because it's an opinion piece, though. Yes, exactly. So certain, you know, and this is a, the I have this this I'm sure you have this tense relationship with editing, because uh, people, people do have do have to call you know have to clarify things. But there's a difference between clarifying things and saying really, I don't want to put this in there because I don't understand it, and so. Um, you know, it, there was always tension around that. Just, sim just in um, uh, e expressing an opinion, which you're right, it's an opinion. But there's some opinions that offend people. And, there, and sometimes it kind of brings out pre people's um, resistance to you, in, and they don't even know it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're saying, well, this is just an editing question. But in fact, what they're calling into question is your view on something. And, in, and, in, and the message is your view is not that legitimate because I don't understand it. Therefore, it's not legitimate. 
And so, you know, I always had to sort of figure out, you know, what battles to fight and which to just not fight. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I still do that. So do you self-edit when you write for the Times instead of the <laughs> weekly? You know, do, I write, do I write differently? Yeah. Um, having, well, it's funny, I started out, as you said, started out writing for the LA Times, and they have a style guide this thick. Things you say, things you can't say. Um, well, one of the things that stuck in my mind was you could never say in print, you couldn't say ghetto, but you could say slum quarters, which, you know. Slum quarter? <laughs> slum quarters. Mm. And you couldn't, and, and the, whole, the whole reference to, Af to, to black was, you could never say, you could never say black as a noun, but you could use it as an adjective, but you had to describe um, dignitaries or important people like Jesse Jackson had to be African American, but everybody else could just be black. It was really weird, <laughs> the way that they, the way, and I just, I just threw out all those rules and just wrote the way I wanted to write. But, so I, I did kind of adjust my tone for the times, take out the four letter words, you know, which is kind of fun. You could do that in the alternative press. And you could be much more opinionated. I really, even though I ended up leaving the weekly and being just frustrated with many things, it was a great turn for me in terms of you could really stretch out. You could really, they wanted your opinion to be out there. So I had to pull it back in, even as an opinion columnist mm -hmm. for the Times, because it's, you know, it's kind of like the audience changes. When the audience changes, then your, you know, your, your tone has to change. And that's something I chafed against because I think, why am I here if I can't speak, if I can't, you know, say things really clearly, then what's the point? So I would just kind of go over the top knowing that they would pull me back, but I would just, you know, re, you know do that and then, and then uh, uh, expect to be tamped down. So. so what's the difference between a journalist and a journalista? <laughs> One's a female. Well, that's it? <laughs> that's just it? That's a word I made up. Another fun thing you can do in the alternative press, you can just make up words and... Uh, <laughs> So I thought it, I think so it might actually it? be Portuguese. a word, though. I don't know if anyone. It's Portuguese. Portuguese, Portuguese, yeah. All right. Well, I didn't know that. It and sounds more Spanish. like a fighter. I was thinking yeah. of more like fashionista yeah. or like that, right? That sounds more so what, is, but what yeah. does that word mean Pernicious. to you? Why do you use that word instead of journalist? Um, it just, it's, just, it's, a, it's a more fun word. It's a cool it, word. Yeah, it, it sounds like a journalist who dresses well, doesn't it? Oh, okay. like a, or someone a scrapper. Was, uh, That's what it sounds a like. Scrapper? Yeah, somebody, a scrapper? What's a scrapper? A scrapper, just somebody Scrappy. who puts their opinion out there, ready to fight. If somebody tells them, oh. "Oh, you know, I don't like what you say," you go back, you know, go right back at them. Yeah. Somebody, you know, who wouldn't take any, uh, what do you say, guff? Ah, from anyone. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like a guerrilla journalist. Really? Yeah. Okay. I kind of thought it sounded like. I was really thinking fashionista. See, that's how shallow I am, really. I was thinking, I was thinking clothing, but I like yours. I like that interpretation better. So what would be your ideal journalistic job for you? Um, gee, um, ideal journalistic job. Uh, I would say being a feature writer. I like to write, you know, I've written long, I've written short. I think it's more frustrating to write short like columns, because you just can't put a story in 800 words. I mean, that's not what it's for, but I always want to tell the entire story. So I would love to be able to write, yeah, I don't know, write for, I don't know who exactly, but be able to write a long story every, I don't know, couple of months or so. Have the time to really, to really, you know. Or like one of the national news magazines yeah, or feature styles. Something, you know what, I would love to write regularly for, say, the Atlantic Monthly or Harper's uh, Magazine. Although they have, that is a really, and I, I love the writing in those magazines, but I have not, very few writers of color. It just, even we have not broken that barrier. That long, <laughs> that long feature writing that takes its time, I love that and that's what I really want to do, but it's very difficult. Um, it, it's really, it's not a very integrated um, uh, discipline. So I'm, so I'm working on, I'm working on that. <laughs> You know, I think that I think that ethnic people are supposed to do commentary, and we do it well. But you know, there's you know, it's nice I think to also so. do it. Yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna wave my magic pen and make you uh, have to go move somewhere in the East Coast and write for Harper's. So you got your ideal job, mm -hmm. but your first assignment mm -hmm. is to write your uh, goodbye to uh, Inglewood in L.A. Oh. Okay. What oh. would you say? You know, my husband says that, you know, he doesn't think I'll ever leave you know, L.A. because I'm just not done with it yet. But, but what would I say if I actually did leave? Yeah. Well, how, how would you say goodbye to L.A. and to uh, Inglewood? Gosh. I don't, I don't know. I, I think I'd hate to actually say it. Maybe I would just do like 
When I leave my house, I don't say goodbye to my dogs. I just say see ya so that they don't get upset. So, <laughs> so that, because uh, they know I'm coming back. So I think I just have to, I think I just have to t turn my back and leave and, and assume I'm coming back at some point. Cause, so I'll uh, be back. I'll be back. But yeah, I, I don't think I'd like to even say a goodbye. Um, and I, I'm sorry, but I can't imagine living on the East Coast. It's way too cold. Oh, it's Georgia or Florida or Texas. Uh, no, I can't. I imagine Texas that even less. I don't know. I was, just, I, I was just kicking her out of California, and I was trying, it, frankly, it didn't matter where I was going to send her. Uh, well, you wanted, know, it's hard to get out of California once you're here. I mean, it's such an end point. Nobody leaves. I mean, it's like a magnet. But you know, it's possible. I think I could write for Harper's. Living in LA, though. I think it's possible. Oh, I know, right? yeah, but I, okay, it didn't. Court, right, that's right. That's it right. didn't work for my story to kick. I needed her to oh, write right. a goodbye oh, story, so that's yeah. that's for the whole uh, whole thing. Yeah. So, um, we talk about minority journalists, and we talk about talking about multicultural LA, but obviously there's different perspectives being African American than being Mexican American. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of African American, you're talking about. I mean, are the glory days of African American political empowerment or economic development or even the you know, South Central musical scene of 40 years ago, all of that, is, that's disappearing. Uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. on the other hand, we have the growth of Mexican Americans and all that. You're talking about riding the wave. It's a very different, uh, different experience. Right. So it's difficult to lump, quote unquote, minority journalists, minority oh, commentators into the, same, into the same category. Yeah, no, of course. And, and uh, I don't do that. Uh, you know, um, it's, conven it's, it's convenient shorthand. But you know something? I came into journalism, like you said, 1992. Things were already declining for black yeah. people. I mean, I got into journalism because so we had a, a riot. <laughs> And it was worse than the 1965 riot, um, and so, so suddenly there was this there was this flurry of concern in '92. Just you know, oh, we should we should expand the media, you know, cover these communities, see what's going on. That lasted three years, and then and then it sort of died away. But I mean, it, I benefited from it because I got into journalism. But then the more I got into it and started looking around and reporting, more I realized it was a community in decline, um, and um, and the glory the glory days of Black LA have long. Yeah. Have long past. I don't mean to say it's dead, but it has to change. Um, there has to be some sort of, um, uh, you know, um, something has to happen, and it feels very critical that something has to happen. Well, what's going to? I mean, what what do you see coming about? What event? What trend that would change the current trend that we see of the declining number of African Americans, the increasing number of Latinos? the increasing importance politically of, of Latinos and then oh, also in other areas. You know what? what trend is out there? I don't know. And in fact, um, uh, there are more dire signs than there are hopeful signs for black people. I was listening to a report, um, Jill Aovi, you know, who covered, covered homicide yeah. in LA for yeah. years. What a horrible beat. But she uh, uh, was talking about the absolute, I mean, and homicide is down in LA. It's actually at a historic <laughs> low. That's a good thing. But the homicide rate among black people is just stays, you know, it's, it's incredibly high for the pop size of the population. And she said she'd been looking at this and looking at this and looking at this, and she says the only, what, she, what she thinks it's, um, it's due to this deep, deep sense of isolation. And the isolation amongst African Americans is different than amongst immigrants. It goes, it's, it's um, in a way um, more acute because we're not immigrants, but yet isolated. And, it's, and, and um, I think we are now newly isolated within a Latino community. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is, so it's like you have these layers of isolation. I, I don't mean that to say, therefore we kill each other. I mean, but there is some connection between, the, I think, the isolation that people feel, even walking around in a quote unquote diverse society that uh, uh, is, almost feels permanent. Yeah. Um, so, so we have about uh, five more minutes with you, so I'm going to ask Gustavo if he's got a question of you, but I also want to see if you have a question of, of Gustavo, and then I'm going to ask maybe a couple, since we won't have her at the end where we're going to ask questions, maybe we could take two or three questions from uh, uh, students out there. But um, do you want to ask her a question? Do you have something to ask her? No, I'm just <laughs> amazed hearing her speak. She's a very good speaker, that's why. Oh, I'm, thanks, no, Gustavo. seriously. Oh. No, so please, no, please. Uh, you, can you, you give me a job? <laughs> can I get her a job? Yeah. 
No, I mean, I talked to you. At, at, Harper, at Harper's. At Harper's. Right? At Harper's. I'm trying to go for Harper's, too. So no. Why? Well, why, do you, why do you want to go hey, for Harper's? Hey, get out of my way. Magazine. I want that spot. <laughs> yeah, no, see. me. No, no, there's, me. O- there's, there's only one uh, Well, there's only one minority That's spot. That's right. There's a competition Richard between. Richard Rodriguez took it last month. Yes. And, and, and uh, John uh, Edgar Weidman. Any, so. Yes, Cornelius. Well, historically, African Americans always vote Democratic. But when it comes to this um, demographic shift, you see people like Ted Haynes. You see a lot of African Americans going with the Minutemen who are. Okay, that's just one though. I mean, that's one. Can, well, a couple, he has, he has a, a couple. He has ten people behind him. I don't, see, I don't know if it's that many, but go ahead. Well, a couple. <laughs> Do you see uh, African Americans maybe joining forces with the Republicans in terms of this whole Minutemen movement? No. Type thing? Here, here's the thing. That's a good point you bring up. Um, uh, black people are actually a lot more sophisticated than people give them credit for. For example, there's a lot of immigrant, there's a lot of anxiety amongst black people about immigration. But they're not going to join the Minutemen because they, they also know, they also recognize, uh, you know, xenophobia when they see it. They know when something is not in their interest. Uh, they know that the Minutemen, in their mind, uh, is sort of anti-human rights, and we can't be about anti-human rights. Even though we might have some nervousness about immigration, we know that does not serve us, the vast majority of us. So um, I say no. And t- this is another thing that irks me about the media. Ted Hayes is not a black leader. He's one man out there with, with a microphone and some paper. And he's joined the Minutemen, so he gets a lot of, he gets a big profile. And you know, that happens in LA. I don't know if this happens in other cities. LA, any fool with a, with a microphone and a, and, 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 and a, a, a so-called. Hey, what are you guys looking at me for? Except this book. This little microphone. Except for us here, right? Yeah, except for us. That's all kind of media play. And somehow I don't think it's happened to New York or places where you have layers of leadership. Here, somebody stands on a, on a corner, and I'm sorry, it's happened a lot with, with um, um, a lot of African Americans who, in the media, assume anybody black saying anything must be a leader. Now, as a friend of mine says, you know, you know what? You, you, you can call yourself a leader, but if, but if nobody's following you, you're not a leader. You're just somebody out there taking a walk. <laughs> and that's right. And, and so, Ted Hayes is um, a guy with a point of view, and, and, and also, he's, believe me, he's really milking that I'm a minute man thing. But the vast majority of black people do not ascribe to that, because they know that anti-immigrationism is about this far away from anti-black sentiments, anti-Semitic, you know, you know it all kind of goes together. So, uh, but they don't, so they have this, they, 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 they do keep that separate. But uh, as I was telling Fernando, but unfortunately, there's no one to represent that sort of yeah. very middle ground, the concerns that they have about, cause, you know, because the concerns about immigration are really concerns about their employment. And employment is another very tortured, you know, it's a very big problem for black people. You know, African Americans in, I think, um, what's the, um, not Detroit, but um, I. Cleveland, Cleveland, Gary. Cleveland, no, no, it was further north. Oh, we just had a, had a primary there. Uh, Wisconsin, was, Milwaukee. Thank you, Milwaukee, thank you. Milwaukee, which just had a primary. Um, 45, 46% of black men in Milwaukee between 16 and 60 have no job. Wow. 46, now what does that mean? That means that's a huge crisis. This was mentioned in the story, as I just mentioned at the end of the story about the primary. It says a lot to me. One, that no one considers it a crisis, except me, I'm sitting there sweating. Because for me, I mean, if we had 46% unemployment of, say, white men, it would be a national friggin' emergency. It would be, we, in your case, too many, that's too many Latinos out of work. Yeah. But somehow, for, for black people, that has just become, no, I'm serious, that's the norm. And so, uh, um, what was my point in that? My point is that our anxiety is about that thing. What we're really anxious about is that statistic. But, we, but we're expressing it through the, through the prism of immigration. And someone has, no one has sort of taken that, you know, peeled that apart. Because people, I just don't think, in a way, care about how black people feel about that. I think the message for us over, over for, with a lot of issues is, you know, just get over it. Just, you know, uh, just uh, get with the program. Because the program's coming and there's not much you can do about it. And that's, the, that's part of the isolation black people feel. Um, that their concerns are simply not at the top of anybody's list. Not even at the top of black uh, leaders, so-called leaders list. Okay. Hey, pass the mic back to uh, Allison back there. Go ahead, Allison. Um, recently, there's been a huge increase in the gang violence between black gang members and gang members who have come here illegally from Mexico. Um, 
in a lot of these lower income neighborhoods. Um, and I was just wondering, how do you feel that this is going to play out? How do you feel that this is gonna actually, you know, are we gonna be able to work through this or do you feel that this is gonna end up in rioting or what's gonna happen? So again, it's about this Latino black tension and it plays itself out in prisons, in politics, but also in gangs. And then for uh, um, Gustavo, why are all Mexican gang members? Yeah, like, here's a gang member right here. <laughs> yeah, representing, right? Well, I'll, I'll, answer, <laughs> I'll, answer, your, I'll answer your question, and then I'm sorry I have to leave. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I really. That's okay. We'll just to, we'll we'll have. I have to go out to Northridge, and, and and I'm already worried about the traffic. But I think we already have riots in. I mean, gang warfare is a form of, of riot to me. Although, you know, the whole black, th there is, and, 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 and you will support me on this, right? Um, maybe. Well, maybe there, is, so. <laughs> there is some, and this is another thing that black leaders don't talk about because they're terrified. There is some, and I stress just some, um, um, anti-black sentiment among some Latino gangs who, you know. It's, uh, no, uh, it's not just some. I mean, there was a federal case done against the Avenues yeah, gang, I the mean, Avenues which gang. was a federal hate crime. By the way, the Avenues gang, yeah, the Avenues gang is not an illegal alien gang. It's been oh, around it's, since it's 1940. A lot of these tensions, a lot of these tensions oh. between I mean, black and brown has been gangs going back <laughs> a long the 50s. time. But I think I think that this sort of new kind of ethnic cleansing thing is is new, and it's just um, um, uh, again that's an issue that I think a lot of has not really been talked about much because it kind of scares people the implications of that. But I think that in LA, I think. Most people, un unless you live in that neighborhood where the gang activity is happening, most people in LA don't think about it. They just hope to avoid it. They'll drive around it. They'll live somewhere where it's not happening. And that's kind of how I think, I think it's how it goes. Um, in the neighborhood where I am, where there are, frankly, a lot of gangs. Um, and we don't have white people lingual. They haven't made it there yet. My, you know, it's just, mm. it might gentrify. gentrify gentrification is a polite word for white people coming to the neighborhood. They're not, a, they've lost enough fear to come into a neighborhood. We don't have that people yet. People with money. People with money. Uh, and so I just think that that's, people figure that's just for people who live there to deal with. And I don't know where it's going to end up. It's, it's, it is a huge problem. I think that, and this is an old cliche, unless you get at the root problems of gangs, um, which have to do with jobs, which have to do with education, um, and a feeling that you, know, you can do something besides be a gang member, I don't think, we're gonna, I don't think it's going to get solved. I just don't think it's going to get solved. So if you know, one, one last question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. KCET's Life and Times, mm -hmm. which I thought was a great show, mm -hmm. okay, uh, no longer exists. You're right. mm -hmm. okay. So, what would be an ideal public affairs show in LA, Southern California, that would talk about these issues? Well, I mean, what would be the format? Does it ha always have to be, you know, four talking heads or something no. like that? Or I mean, how? I mean, if you if you were asked to be on an advisory board about developing a new PBS show. What what would be some of the ideas that would come to you right away? Well, just you know, we, we've spent the last ten minutes saying how we don't have a forum to talk about all of the layers and the nuances of the whole Black Latino um, thing. By the way, you got to have white people talk about it too, because what we, we you know we tend to we kind of tend to isolate these ethnic discussions as if the only players are. African Americans, Latinos, when it really involves everybody in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. But here's a good question: Do you like to hear people talk, or do you like yeah. to actually? meet the people on the street that are, you know, like, would you rather have people discuss what's happening in your neighborhood, or would you rather have us take a camera to your block and spend time with you in your block? Uh, people can do that. I'd rather see some, something that would, that would <coughs> instigate change, you know, or that, that would somehow direct the, address the problem. Uh, although, you know, I mean, a show, any attention would be, would, be, would be great. I think any, any, any discussion, um, and, and getting people on a show who are not the usual suspects. Um, but how do you identify those people? The same people come out every five minutes, right. basically. Right. Yeah. Um, well, they're, you know, they're You Google them, and if they, if they show up too much, don't use them. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, Sorry, Gustavo, you're not sorry. a part of this. <laughs> that puts me down. And, and, and also, to kind of get, be, I, mean, I mean, it's great that people always say we need to have more dialogue. Yes, we do. We need to come together. We also need to talk about things that make us uncomfortable. I would just, I think the name of the show would be the things that make us uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> well, Not, I, I'm sort of tired, I mean, I understand the approach of we all need to get along. I think we all get along pretty good. You know, we're all here, people different colors, we're not shooting each other, you know. I think that's not the issue. No, the, for the most part, people, it's pretty, pretty peaceful. 
blacks, for example, blacks and Latinos are, for the most part, they coexist. They may not be buddy buddy, but they coexist. Right. Um, but I would like to, t I think what we're really missing is talk about things that we don't like to talk about. And then, you know, from there, I think we can get to some real partnership and some real kind of, you know, collaborations, which everybody loves to talk about that. But they really, it really takes some, you know, um, working through to, to get to real, you know, collaboration doesn't just happen. People, you gotta have a reason, you know? Well, we wanna thank you for your time. And I, we really yes, thank you for that. your time. I really saw I have to go. So right now we're gonna play a, um, a, a very quick, uh, CD of uh, some life and times. This shows. is actually from our goodbye show. So. A goodbye show. So was it the last show? No, it was the third to the last. Third to the last. You'll get an idea of the scope of the, right. of the series right. over 16 years. And, and what I'm trying to create here by bringing these type of guests is the civic dialogue. There's a way that we talk about issues that uh, especially people like Gustavo or Aaron uh, or Val or all kinds of other, including Hugh Hewitt, who we're going to see here mm -hmm. and other people. Yeah. Do we have to have a discussion about what are the issues that are going on in Los Angeles? And we've tried to do that in this forum for you guys, specifically today, but also there has to be a more mass appeal. And you know, we don't, the, the death of this show, to me, is disturbing in that it's the decline of the civic dialogue that has been occurring. Um, it started in 1992, That's right. the very year that the riots That's occurred. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't start because of the riots, it no. started a little bit right before. But another great show, uh, which is on the radio, Which Way LA, which appears on KCRW's uh, TV um, station uh, with Warren Only, that started because Precisely, of the riots. Yes. So let's show a little bit about it. Uh, a we'll bit just watch like three minutes. Three minutes, yeah. It's just, just so you guys can get a, a flavor of it. And by a generous grant from Jim and Ann Rothenberg. Hello, I'm Val Zavala. Tonight is bittersweet. This is the last week of broadcasts for Life and Times. We're looking forward to developing a new local news magazine to air later in the spring. But for now, we're looking back, way back. Even before Life and Times, KCT was committed to covering local news and issues. Some of you may remember 28 Tonight from the late 70s. It was hosted by one of the most respected newsmen in LA, Cleet Roberts. Cleet Roberts kicked off what became a long commitment to local news coverage. I came to the station in 1987 as a reporter covering some hot issues. The only difference between what's happening in here and what's happening in our atmosphere is that our atmosphere doesn't use glass. Then in 1989, we launched a new show called By the Year 2000 that looked toward the new millennium. Science fiction writers have conceived a Los Angeles of the future gleaming chrome and glass buildings, ultra-sleek skyscrapers, everything clean and modern, and standing on the buried ruins of the past. But no series has had the longevity of life and times. It started in 1992 as a forum for friendly political feuding between Hugh Hewitt, Pat Morrison, Ruben Martinez, and later Kerman Maddox. Now at the time, none of them had had any broadcast experience. Their very first television appearance came on January 13, 1992, the night that Life and Times debuted. Welcome to the very first edition of Life and Times, KCET's new daily news and information program. We'll be bringing it to you every Monday and Friday evening at 7.30. I just always liked working with Ruben and Kerman and Pat just talking around the table about whatever the issues of the days were. People sitting down and talking about their differences and trying to understand why there were differences in the first place. That simply wasn't being done in that format, in the context, at the length and in the depth with which we did it at Life and Times. The thing that I'll always remember with fondness is News of the Week, which gave me and Pat and Hugh and Ruben an opportunity to really kind of engage and talk about local public policy issues, transportation, health care, public safety, and really kind of get in it. You're yeah. trying to finesse this. Look, <laughs> if this took place in Southern California, Northern California, if you look at the results, the majority of people who went to the polls basically did disagree. not vote against it. They basically voted for the maintenance of taxes because I think 
they understand that vital services are needed. Libraries, spend. parks, and right things. It's not spend. spend. It's not spend. 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 Cities did not bring. What you have to say is those Outnumbered cities. Outnumbered virtually five this to one. This is not spin. No, no, no. Come on. Eight cities voted yes in LA County. Two voted Speaking no. Speaking of spin, we but have to stop your to spin, spin the schedule. to spin the schedule for next week. I think I'd been on the job like 10 days when the, the Rodney King riots broke out. We, all the Life and Times folks, were standing at KCET behind the gate, looking across the street, watching looting going on. It was, it was a crazy thing, you know, crazy feeling. History was going on in the moment, and we were talking about it in the moment. If you are within reach of this program, you have probably smelled the smoke from our burning city. You have probably driven home on its empty streets and freeways, and you know that what is going on is an earthquake of sorts, a social upheaval of an immense magnitude. The whole world is indeed watching us, and this special edition of Life and Times is intended to reach all the people in your homes and on the street. There is no we or they right now. The, the, the violence is spread uh, all over the, the, the inner city and into Hollywood. Uh, where the KCT studio? That gives you an idea of how it first started. Since then, now, let it me went just, through a lot of different things. Let me just say, this is, this is Ruben Martinez. How yeah. many of you recognize him? Do you recognize him? He's one of our professors yeah. now. He's a professor of English here. After he left the program, he went to the University of Houston, and then we recruited him to come back about two years ago. That's right. And so he's, uh, and you'll see his columns every once in a while in the, um, in the, um, the LA Times and in other publications. But he's our Fletcher Jones Chair of uh, Anthropology. No, writing. Writing. Fletcher writing. Jones. Writing. Yeah, the Fletcher. Water cars. The That's right. Mercedes Benz, New York <laughs> Beach. That's right. Wow. That's right. Now, all, with all those cars, they had enough money left over to give yeah. to LMU a couple of million so we could uh, create that uh, yeah, chair now be Married with button. two kids, the whole thing. Right. Yeah. right. So, um, we, Gustavo, when you take a look at this, you know, the, the format, you, I mean, you came onto the scene because you started, a, a, in a sense, a very different little format that has really taken off. What, what would you, you start thinking about your career in terms of television? What kind of format? I mean, wh why, why do you think this is off the air now? It, I honestly, it's, it's a shame that it is. I think it's off the air because for the most part, people don't want that sort of civil discussion. The people are scared. When it comes to discussion, what I've seen, you could correlate sort of the decline of life and times with the rise of talk radio, which is basically people love to hear people scream at each other. You saw Hugh, you know, you saw Hugh talking with uh, Ruben and Pat. They didn't agree with each other, not at all. I mean, Hugh's very much to the right, Ruben's very much to the left, Pat's you know, kind of to the left, more toward the middle, but they had a civilized discussion. But now you tune on Fox News, you even tune on CNN, any of these shows, people just yell at each other, yell at each other. Or the other thing is like on KPFK, on NPR, or, or even on Fox News, you'll have uh, echo chambers, well, where you recruit somebody who agrees just like you and you talk about things that you agree with each other. People don't want to hear an actual discussion happening like on Life and Times. And what they didn't show on this clip also afterwards, Life and Times, they would go out there on the streets and do uh, mm -hmm. profiles. Val actually yeah. did a profile on me yeah, in, uh, back in 2006. And so I, that's what to me was so genius about Life and Times. You combine the debate and the discussion with profiles of the community that you're at. And people, I guess don't want to see that anymore. Mm -hmm. So, how many of you had seen Life and Times before? Raise your hand. Well, it's not bad for you guys this are getting demographic. People? Yeah, yeah. Not it's not bad for this. Yeah. Okay, so what? You guys, well, wait, wait, wait. Is, you're you're a public television station. Right. You don't have to have ratings. That's right. <laughs> so why why did you take I'm it off? Me, there were some nights when we didn't. So <laughs> you know, it's so funny because a lot of people think, oh, why did you take that off? And they have these conspiracy theories and so forth. And you know what? It almost always comes down to is economics. It's not because we didn't believe in the in the in the cause or, the, or the, the commitment. Like I said, with our commitment to public affairs has gone back years and years and years, and we are in development for a new show. It came back, and it, it's, it's ironic because I'm probably, I don't know if I should say it on tape, I'm probably one of the people who are most, shall I say, relieved that Life and Times went away because we had a tiny staff trying to produce a quality show five nights a week. We were killing ourselves, and we were struggling constantly to maintain the quality. And when you run into someone like Gustavo, you point a camera at him, it's a slam dunk, it's a great piece. He just has tons of fun. But you don't always have that. And, you, and so many times you did not have the time. We had to shoot something one day. You really needed to shoot it in three days. We could only edit it in, in six hours. You really needed two days to edit it. And so we were struggling constantly with the quality because we did not have the resources to produce a quality product five nights a week. Our PR people don't 
<laughs> necessarily would like me to say that, but that was the truth of the matter. It hadn't had anything to do with commitment to Los Angeles or local public affairs or, or coverage of substance of regional issues. So, for a lot of reasons that are too tedious and boring to explain here, we had the opportunity to close out Life and Times and to raise a little bit more money, and we are now developing, but we have this gap in production, which for me is an absolute luxury because I'm not killing myself every day. We now are developing a weekly prime time, won't be at 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock is not prime time, prime time's from 8, 8 p.m. to 11, mm -hmm. a local prime time news magazine that will be higher quality, faster paced, and believe me, it'll be more watchable. Because although we did some great stuff, I'm the first one to admit that when I do an interview with somebody, many times, like Fernando can hold seven minutes because he's quick and keeps you thinking, but many times you interview someone and you're thinking, oh, this needs to be four minutes, not seven, and you're watching the last three minutes going, I wish I had something else to put in here, but you don't have the resources to go produce another three-minute piece. So then this new show will be faster paced, we'll have more resources, it'll be more watchable, and here's what's really important, it's going to have a major website that will go along with it so you can connect with anybody that you saw on that show, any of the issues you saw on that show, talk to people who are also interested in that issue, and we're going to be able, since it's only on weekly, we will often, whenever possible, put news or stories or, or mm -hmm. whatever we're working on on the web first. So you don't necessarily have to wait till Thursday night or whenever it's on to see it. So you don't know what day of the week it's going to be I'm on yet? I'm guessing it'll be on Thursday because that way we, we can kind of sum up the news of the week. Uh -huh. And and then mm -hmm. we'll also be able to repeat it on Friday and Saturday. My guess is it'll be that kind of like 10 o'clock or something uh -huh. on and Thursday. And what's going to be the format? Another. It will know. be a combination. It's a tentative title, by the way. If anybody has any better ideas, email me. Is SoCal Connected or SoCal, SoCal Connection? SoCal Connected, hey, I don't know I about know. that. Everyone yeah. has SoCal, their opinion. Yeah. Names are, you can you spend hours and hours well, we'll have We'll names. have a contest. Whoever comes up with a better name will give you two tickets to a Laker game. Oh, there you yeah. go. Okay. So uh, this was only for this group. Who's ever watching on TV? Truly, no, it's only this. Seriously, you can uh, tell me. So, so uh, let's g give us a name again so we can compare that. Well, the working title, big working title, SoCal, meaning Southern California, obviously, Connected. Yeah, well, and because because we used to have a, a statewide show, California Connected, connected. which was really great, and then life, but California Connected was a very high budget, had all the bells and whistles, and we were always jealous of them because they had like all this great money, and then there was little poor life and times down here. Well, in fact, we're merging the best of the two, and um, and we hope to bring you know like I said the website faster pace. We're still going to have an in depth cover story by the way, which is field based. Then we're going to have commentaries, so a lot more people, people like Gustavo, we're hoping to recruit, by the way, yeah, to do like, you know, really neat one and a half minute commentaries. We're going to have um, a roundup of, of the news, and if one particular story is big, we'll do a minute and a half package on that. Uh, we're going to have features, interesting places and people, so it's going to be more watchable, faster, updated graphics. You know, Life and Times had these old-fashioned graphics, and I think it's going to be all around better, so I'm really looking forward to it. So it's going to cover Orange County as well? Oh, regional, major regional. That's one of the challenges of cover, and Gustavo, I'm sure you know, it is so hard to cover Southern California because you have this massive city called Los Angeles, which is the gorilla in the room, and yet whenever you do something, you know, about, say, Pico Boulevard and Olympic being one-way streets, you have to realize that that doesn't interest a huge number of people in Santa Barbara, Palm Springs, you know, Orange County, that we cover. And Inglewood, so, Huntington Park, exactly. they don't care about it either. It's like, well, that's fine, but I didn't know where Pico or Olympic is. And so one of the most difficult things, if you were a journalist, covering Southern California is choosing those stories that have interest and resonate with, what is it, 12, 13 million people in the five county area? 18 million. 18 wow. million people. 18 million. Many of whom live if you live in Riverside when's the last time that you were in Pacific Palisades probably never so how do you choose stories that are of an interest and enlighten such a diverse regional and, and huge population it's really tough well traffic is always good because no matter where you live exactly traffic, actually you know, bad weather is always good you know housing but, prices is always you know there's, yep. a, there's a lot of issues that impact just about everybody in uh, exactly Southern California right. irrespective of uh, wh where you and live then, and then there's all those there's tiny stories that are tiny but interest everybody, like you know the dog food prank and the fire, the LA fire. Tenny Pierce. Exactly yeah. the Tenny Pierce case and suing for having you know somebody put dog food in spaghetti. That's a very, very very localized story, but everybody attends to it because it's interesting. So you did a profile on Gustavo. Yes, we did. How come? Because I heard about this guy and ask a Mexican, and I said, and I I 
I think I just called you. It's a couple years ago before you became famous. <sighs> Still uh, not famous. And, and uh, anybody who's on Colbert, I haven't been on Colbert. Yet. <laughs> so anybody who's on Colbert, that's pretty famous. And I think I read your column, and it was just so gutsy. And I said, oh my gosh, this person's got to be fun. And I think I heard you on the radio or something. I could tell you were a live wire. That's all it takes. We don't do research in TV. We just say, this guy's a live wire. Yeah, he, Go he, for it. You just, rip, you just rip off the LA Times. Yeah, that's, all, that's yeah. right. It was the LA Times. It was the LA Times that did a profile on me, yeah. That's right. And then I think I heard you. So I knew that you were a high energy. So I said, oh, good. So we just went down. We followed him around. Our camera guy could hardly keep up with you. He just like runs everywhere. I really do. <laughs> you really do. <laughs> And that it was really fun, sat down and talked to them. Now that was shot in like three, two, three hours, I think. We spent Something like that, A little that, bit yeah. on the street, then followed you around in his office, and then we sat him down for an interview, and we came out with like seven and a half minute piece on Gustavo, shot in maybe three hours. I can guarantee you, and maybe you've had things done on you since, like network or other major production, mm -hmm. they would have spent three days. <coughs> they would have spent three days. So, that, so we had, we've gotten really good at doing a lot with very little, but at times it was a little, a little too little. <laughs> so, Gustavo, ask a Mexican, what's the origins? I mean, it's kind of obvious, but anyway. The, the origins, it's, it's multi-layered, and I'll try to go th through it as fast as possible. I, you know, I come from Orange County. Orange County, of course, is the Mexican-hating capital of the United States. There's just, and, and, and on both sides, you know, you have extremists on both sides of the issue, specifically with illegal immigration, but also with Mexicans. You know, so you have one side saying, you know, oh, there's this reconquista happening, and Mexicans are trying to take over the Southwest United States and turn it into Aslan. And then you have Mexicans saying, you know, which is just absolute insanity. Like, you know, um, Ted Hayes, he's insane. Jesse Lee Peterson, all the, uh, Terry Anderson, it's all part of that same, you know, American Patrol, Glenn Spencer part. That's one part. Then you have another part saying this used to be all land, all gringos out, which is, I mean, both sides just stupid. So as a reporter, I've been a reporter with the OC Weekly since 2001, immigration was always one of my big beats. And so as a reporter, you're always trying to cover, if you have a beat, you try to cover it in the different ways. So I would do investigative stories, like I, you know, I infiltrated a hate group for about three years until one time I stupidly, stupidly outed myself. Um, I, I basically, I, you know, I had a, I had a sticker little, here that said, hi, my name is, and I wrote Gustavo Ariano, and it's completely stupid. Before I would go under pseudonyms. You know, I would do that. I'd do first-person narratives about my own family's history. My mom, she was a legal immigrant. My dad came in the trunk of a Chevy in 68. Um, you know, just every single way possible. So around November of 2004, uh, my boss at the time, Will, you know, Will Swain, he was driving down Main Street in the city of Santana, which is one of the most Latino cities in the United States. So he's driving down Main Street in his BMW, and then he sees this big, huge billboard for El Piolin. And m most of you know, so, you know, some of you folks know who El Piolin is. For those of you who don't, he's the most listened to DJ in the United States with a daily morning audience of 19 million. Number two, Rush Limbaugh, he has an audience of 12 million. And the other thing that El Piolin's uh, famous for or notorious for, he was the one who really set into motion all those amnesty marches from 2006. So El Piolin, you know, he's half social advocate, half Howard Stern. So this billboard had El Piolin, this Mexican guy with, you know, he was, ha he was wearing a Viking helmet looking out toward the ocean where there was an iceberg. Makes no sense whatsoever, so my boss comes back to me. <laughs> no, no sense. I mean, he's never done a skit about Vikings that I know of. So my boss comes back to me and says, oh, you know, I saw some Mexican guy in a billboard with a Viking helmet. Who is that guy? And I looked at him, I'm like, that's El Piolin. You're kind of dumb for not knowing who he is. <laughs> and only because of this, you know, not, not because he's white or anything, but I said, you know, as the editor of a major newspaper in Southern California, for you not to know who El Piolin is, that's kind of, it's a travesty. So, but rather than him being insulted, he's like, you know what, there's a lot of dumb gringos like me. So why don't we do this one-time only satirical column, we call it Ask a Mexican, and we basically pretend, since Orange County in some ways is so ignorant about Mexicans, where you make up, a, you know, you answer questions about Mexicans. And I actually told them, I, I told them no at first, only because I thought nobody would be interested. You know, we were only supposed to do it that, you know, just one time. So he kind of goaded me into it. I said, okay, fine, you know, we'll do it as a joke because OC Weekly, once in a while, will run fake news stories just to keep people on their feet. So, <laughs> we seriously do. So, you know, try to guess which ones. So, you know, I go back, I go back and I make up a question for myself. So, you know, I write myself, and, and so, you know, going back, I'm thinking to myself, how do I make a satirical column 
about people asking questions about Mexicans. So I said, okay, I know exactly how to do it. So, you know, I started off like all advice columns, dear whatever. So in this case, it was, dear Mexican, why do Mexicans call white people gringos? And then my response was, dear Gabacho, Mexicans do not call gringos gringos. Only gringos call gringos gringos. Mexicans call gringos gabachos. So, <laughs> so I thought, though, you know, obviously, as a Mexican, I already called a gringo a gringo. So I'm sort of uh, invalidating my own answer right there. But I thought it was so over the top that people would get it. And, you know, and then to make matters worse, we put, you know, as the logo for it, this caricature of this big, fat Mexican guy with a gold tooth, a mustache, big sombrero and bandoliers, like the, ar you know, the archetype of the bandito stereotype. And at the very end, I wrote, got a spicy question about Mexicans? Ask the Mexican, and then I put my email at, at, the, at the end. We knew it was gonna get a reaction, and you know, people wrote in and said, oh, I hate it or I love it. We never expected once in a million years for people to call me on my bluff about asking questions about Mexicans. So the minute the column hit the streets, people just started sending in <laughs> questions, and it, it hasn't stopped since. Yeah, so the, the, so so the, the never, joke... So you never had to make up another question? I, yeah, that was the only question I ever made up. Every other question, somebody has sent it in to me. So, I mean, and nowadays, you know, my archives, I have 223 pages of questions I haven't answered yet. So you can say, stop sending questions for a while. Yeah, and, uh, and I, I could continue the column for six years. So, uh, Gustavo, <laughs> in class, why do all Mexicans sit together? <laughs> Social cliques. It's all social cliques. The nerds sit with the nerds, the jocks with the jocks. It's human society. It's not a Mexican thing. Oh, okay. Absolutely. I mean, it, it was interesting because when I was in Anaheim, it, you know, Anaheim High School, sorry, Anaheim High School is like 95% Latino, vast majority Mexican. So everyone's Mexican, but the Mexican nerds sat with the Mexican nerds and, you know, the couple of white nerds with us, the jocks were jocks. Social, the human beast is a very interesting beast. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, how about some, anybody have a question to ask about a Mexican or any other topic? <laughs> or any other topic. Yeah, wait, uh, let's, well, well, where's the there, mic? There's a lady right there. Uh, just right I, behind I, them, I right there. I learned a lot from your column, by the way, I really do, because I'm like the super assimilated, you know, my the father. Pocha. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm the pocha. I learned that. I learned that was a pocha from, from my father's from Mexico, my mother's, you know, French and German and stuff, and so I'm like totally the mixture and went off and had, you know, good school, came back, learned, in, learned Spanish mainly in Spanish class. And because my father spoke beautifully, but he wouldn't speak to us. Okay. So, you know, so I learned a lot from him. Well, thank you. <laughs> I think. I included, <laughs> it, but my, although my, my father, you know, always parked the car in the lawn, so it's like, I think it was one of your questions. Why, why, do, why do Mexicans why park, do Mexican park, park their car in the lawn? Because my dad did that. So, I never asked him why, though. I know, why, I know what you're going to ask. What am I going to ask? Why do Persians and Mexicans get confused? That is so not what I was going to okay. ask. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I was going to ask, what is the most interesting question someone's ever asked you about Mexicans? I, I get, I've received so many questions, and I continue to receive so many questions. In one way, just the fact that people even ask me questions to me is fascinating. It's fascinating and disturbing and just strange. I mean, no, seriously. Remember, we only want, I only wanted to do a joke as a commentary about Orange County, about how clueless Orange County was. And then it became, I mean, the column now comes out in 33 newspapers across the country. Yeah, weekly circulation of two million. It came out as a book last year. It's gonna come out in paperback in April. I mean, it's really become very popular. Not, you know, not all the questions are racist. There are all types of different questions. And so because of that, I get all types of topics, language, sex, you know, racist questions. The most racist questions I've received have actually been from Mexicans talking trash on African Americans. You know, you know, I wish Erin was here to hear that so she would, you know, get very, very upset at me. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, I get all types of questions. You know, so I'll tell you the most, the smartest question I ever received. A guy wrote in and said, whatever happened to the lazy Mexican, because all I hear nowadays is that they're stealing our jobs. And to me, it, it, to me, it got to the root of so much of this anti-immigrant hysteria, because it's true. I mean, this traditional stereotype of Mexicans has been, oh, lazy Mexicans, Mexicans sleeping under cactus or whatever. Now you hear this, you know, Mexicans are stealing our jobs and everything like that. So I made the correlation, though, between you know, the United States has this love-hate relationship with immigrants, whether legal or illegal, where it's stereotypes. So you have, you know, Chinese people either being a coolie or being an opium smoker. You have Irish folks being, you know, drunkards or, uh, you know, ward bosses. All, you, you can see the strain. And that's what I try to do with the column, specifically with Mexicans. It's my, you know, it's my argument that this Mexican migration, this Mexican invasion, whatever, it's no different than the Mexican, you know, than the 
migrations of the past with the one little wrinkle of illegal immigration, but I'm saying socially, it's no different. It's no different. So. Um, ask a Mexican. It's been around now for what, three years? Since November of 2004, so a little bit over three, three years. Three years, yeah. okay. When Life in Time started in 1992, there's no way this could have happened. I mean, what is it well, about no way that could, well, well, what could have happened. this phenomena that we, um, e even, even the, the attempt at it just being a satirical piece to correct, begin with, correct. and well, the my, fact that it would have taken off. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying that back in 1992, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, because, well, I think what happens here is it goes back to the dynamics of, uh, it's almost a, a scientific law where one reaction triggers an opposite and equal reaction. I think what's happened with political correctness and in and in uncorrect political whatever is the fact that the more the sort of the pressure is on society to be polite and be politically correct, the more we trigger these other extremes. Like Chris Rock can say stuff that he would never have been able to say in 1992. You can do things never been able to say in 1992. So uh, while part of society is moving toward this, let's get along, let's multicultural political correctness, it is causing a, a opposite and equal reaction. Whereas the really outspoken people, comedians and so forth, are even more outrageous than they've ever been. You see, people always say that. They say, oh, 10 years ago, you couldn't have done this particular column. And I don't necessarily agree. This is what, this is what the, you know, I will say this, that I don't think this column could have started ever in Los Angeles. Because in Los Angeles, you know, especially with a lot of Latinos, a lot of people in college, they're just way too uptight. There has to be, you know, this thing, oh, you can't go there. You can't make fun of that. So the very fact that I come from Orange County, you know, mostly when I tell people I'm from Orange County, oh, yeah, it's all white conservatives there. Well, no, they're all in Newport Beach and go to the Casa. But, you know, from Orange County, I do think that gives you a little bit of a skewed sense of how to relate, you know, when it comes to issues of ethnicity and so forth. And, you know, so I always tell people that the only place that Ask a Mexican could have ever started would have been in the OC Weekly or in a neo-Nazi publication. No other paper would have ever done something yeah, like exactly. that. Exactly. Well, one opposite, you know, opposites create an opposite equal reaction. Yeah. So, what, in, in terms of we, I asked, talk, talk to uh, Aaron, that if we moved you out of Orange County and you had to come up to the big city in L.A. <laughs> Please. <laughs> and, you, and you had to write your uh, your goodbye column. What, what, what would you write about? What, what would be the uh, the essence of that? I honestly, what I would do is another another of my big beats. It, I would call it the history beat, which is I basically get stories that are seventy years old and find them and retell them and try to make it pertinent. Because one of the things with Orange County, it loves to project. I mean, much more so, much more so than Southern California in general. But Orange County loves to project this image of paradise. I mean, we were always, we weren't LA. You know, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have blacks. In fact, nowadays, Orange County is like 2% black, which I've done the study of all the major metropolitan areas in the country. It's by far the most abysmal rate. And I mean, there's a reason why it's there. And, you know, I'm not going to get into the history of it, but I would basically do a history piece and say, look, Orange County, you always try to project this image. Back in the days, we used to make orange crate labels that were so beautiful and idyllic with names like Esperanza and Mission brand. Nowadays, we have shows like the OC, Laguna Beach, The Real OC, The Real Housewives, they all project that same image. I would just basically do something that embarrasses who I call the Lords of Orange County and say, uh-uh, this is the real Orange County, folks. Goodbye, I love you, and bam. <laughs> <laughs> to the, the quote-unquote official Orange County. But you, love, but you love Orange I County. Love or I love Orange County, because, but here's the thing. Going back to that orange crate label, you know, they always showed the orange. The, but and, that, and was, is, but that, that was just the uh, advertisement, like no, the advertisement no. today. Oh, no, I mean, come on. We're at a university. We know, you know, we know what goes with you know, semiotics and what symbols mean. Right. Those was, orange crate labels, they gave the rest of the United States a sense of, ah, here's your Eden on the West right. Coast. So you have the orange, the, orange, um, the orange trees. You don't have the Mexicans picking them. And I don't say it just as a you know bitter Mexican, you know, uh, uh, no, as a bitter descendant of an orange picker. It's reality. One, you know, during the 1930s, if you guys are you know students of histories, there were agricultural strikes up and down California. I mean, all all across it. One of the most brutal, one of the most brutal strikes was in Orange County, 1936 citrus strike. You look in the Orange County history books to a degree. There's no mention of it whatsoever. Even the LA Times back in 1975, they did a story about how no one ever talks about the citrus strike. So, I mean, talking about the orange crate labels, you know, that's, you know, like the old uh, John Wayne movie says, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. So those orange crate labels started off as just advertisement. Now they, they, pass, off, they pass them off as history. 
So yeah, so that's my big Valentine to Orange So County. have you ever written a story that even the OC Weekly wouldn't uh, print or make you change somewhat? When it comes to the editing process, or even the story process, and Val could talk about this, you'll have an editor. Every writer should have an editor, and the editor will say, no, this doesn't work. Not so much because they don't want to print it, but just because it's not working or whatever. So there, there hasn't been any story that my editors have ever rejected. You know, People always ask me about the column. Is there ever a question that you won't answer? And no, I mean, I'll answer any and all questions. The more offensive, frankly, the better, because it allows me, no, it allows me to show how ridiculous a question is. Now, I'll give you an idea of one of the most offensive questions I ever got. Uh, you know, somebody wrote in and said, why do Mexican men rape more than other, you know, than white men? And, you know, that's a stupid, stupid question. So I'm like, okay, fine, fine. Let's play your game. So, you know, I went to the Bureau of Justice, who keeps the stats on rapes and all types of crimes. I did my math, and, you know, and statistically, and let's just play games here, statistically, White men are, twi are twice more likely to rape than Mexican men. And, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to say, oh, it's because of your white race, therefore that makes you want to rape more. It's because it's, it's absolutely st stupid. But the person who asked this question, they were trying to say, oh, because of your ethnicity, that's what makes Mexican you know, rape more, supposedly. So yeah, I mean, and that's a really offensive question. I got a lot of people you know, upset that I would even publish a question like that. But my point was, no, you have to, you have to confront you know, racism, you have to confront stereotypes, bigotry, all that stuff. That's the reason why I did that column, and that's, why, that's the reason why I still continue to do that column. So Orange County has dramatically changed. I mean, it, it is what, over 20% Latino now? No way, it's 33. 33%? Third. And what percent uh, Asian? It's, Orange County is majority minority now. So basically, Orange County is about third Latino, 25% Asian. And then, you know, uh, two or three percent African American. We also have a lot of Arabs and Persians that would c technically classify as white, but, you know, that's not how it's going to show, you know, th their own ethnicity is not going to show up in the census. And then whites, you know, whites, so to speak, are like 48 percent. Within 30 years, Orange County is supposed to be majority Latino. So besides the major demographic shift that we've seen in Orange County, which happened in, in Los Angeles, what are some of the other major changes that you've seen growing up in terms of Orange County? It's, it's interesting because I, always, I grew up in basically the Orange County of today because I you know, born and raised in Anaheim, went to Anaheim High. All around me, everybody was immigrant. The, the, you know, the quote unquote white kids, they were immigrants from Eastern Bloc countries, from, specifically from Romania. The black kids, they were immigrants from Ethiopia, Ghana, Nigeria. The Asian kids are all Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees. And of course, all the, you know, but it was vast majority Mexican. So actually, you know, growing, you know, still sometimes to this day, whenever I, if I go to Newport Beach, I'm like, Wow, I haven't seen so many white people in a long time. Just because I'm usually surrounded by you know, a lot of Mexicans, just a very multicultural uh, surroundings with me. So I mean, so in terms of how it's changed, you know, on a personal level, my family we left from a really tough neighborhood to more of a working class neighborhood, and we actually saw in our neighborhood, it was in Northern Anaheim, we saw white flight in progress. We saw all the white families move one by one by one until there's one white family left and they're the dirtiest people on the block. They don't, they don't mow their lawn, they, you know, they have their car on the lawn. These are white people, not Mexicans. And, it, I mean, and you have all the immigrant families there, you know, manicured, brought iron fences, and they call the city and say, that family there on the block, you know, they're, they're basically the NIMBY people. And they're all Mexican immigrants who mostly speak Spanish. So, <laughs> only in America. Um, what, what about the, the civic discussion in Orange County? I mean, is it too much captured by the LA media market? Uh, and you talk about the OC Weekly, there's a... The Register. Uh, the Register. But in terms of, I'm talking to Val about having a television show, a public affairs show, but are there radio shows that are specifically to Orange County? Or is there, other than the Weekly and the Register, is there anything... There's you, a KDOC thing. The, right? Well, yeah. public... There, yeah. yeah we have a public channel, uh, KDOC. No, KDOC is the KDOC is, is commercial. Co commercial, but they but mostly show the Hawaii Five O reruns. Oh yeah, that Daybreak they have OC. That nah, okay. That's not good. <laughs> um, there's KOCE, which has Inside OC with Rick Reef and also Real Orange, and you know it's very genteel and and it, it is kind of sort of a public affairs show. But we've always had a huge problem. I would also even more so than the Inland Empire in that we've all, we're still technically under the you know, DMA, the designated market area of Los Angeles. So we don't have our own main, you know, big right. television stations like, you know, 
you know, growing up, I grew up with, uh, you know, Hal Fishman, all of, you know, Channel 5, Channel 11, all those folks. But they were mostly covering stories in L.A. I've, I've actually seen more of an emphasis now on Orange County stories in the years coming from Los Angeles. But because they realize, hey, there's three million people in Orange County we're not really covering and we should. And I think, though, that's the other thing about Orange County different from L.A. L.A., yeah, you have the megalopolis that is Los Angeles and all its ancillary cities. Orange County, we have 33 different cities, each with their own history, identity. So to have really an Orange County identity, it's something that's still formulating. Because I mean, there's not really a center in Orange County. There, like there, I mean, at least in, in LA County, you've got LA. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in Orange County, you, don't, you have no real center. The government's in Santa Ana. The sports franchises, the Ducks and the Angels, they're in Anaheim. A lot of the high, you know, all the rich old money's in Newport Beach, and all, a lot of the high tech companies are in Irvine. It's spread all over the right. place. So what do you see yourself doing in five years? Still in Orange County. Still a journalist? Still a journalist. Yeah, yeah, still a journalist. Journalism. What if they offer you your own TV show? I'll do it. You know, no. Jur journalism to me. Somebody will offer it. <laughs> journalism to me, it's about going, it's, you know, what do they say? Afflict the comforted and comfort the afflicted. So as a journalist, whether I'm doing on radio, on television, in print, on the internet, I'm always looking for stories that no one else are telling. I'm always going after bad guys. I'm basically throwing firebombs to the people who deserve it and, you know, highlighting stuff, issues, people, restaurants that deserve issues. I'd love to do something on television. I actually, I think radio, I would like, I like radio a lot because that, I mean, it's wide audience. You get immediate feedback from people and, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, it, but here's the other thing. I, I'm doing those things right now. Like every other week, I'm on Air Talk with Larry Mantle talking about Orange County issues. You know, once a month, I'll go on on Kevin and Bean or different shows, just you know, specifically the Ask a Mexican hour, so to speak. And, you know, even once in a while, like KFI one time invited me three hours, Ask a Mexican. And that was the best experience of my life. <laughs> uh, with, with a KFI nation, are you kidding me? I love it. Yeah. So what, what are the big issues in Orange County this year? I mean, immigrate. Well, go ahead. Immigration has been the issue in Orange County from day one. I mean, again, going back to the history books, and shameless plug if I haven't given enough already, um, I'm actually coming out with the history of Orange County in September. It's half history, half memoir of Orange County where I get into, more, into those details. So I would say immigration and religion are always the big issues. I mean, Orange County is this nexus point of major religious movements in the United States. You have TBN, the world's largest evangelical network there. You have you know, the Purpose Driven Life at Saddleback Church, Calvary Chapel, and you know, the Diocese of Orange, all, all these different things. So immigration, housing, of course. Housing, it's huge. You, you've, we've actually had an exodus of young people like your age you know, going out to Long Beach and you know, the Inland Empire because they can't afford to live in Orange County. You, you know, the cheapest place to live would be places like Santa Ana, Anaheim, more, much more lower income neighborhoods where, yeah, there are gangs and you have to deal with that. How about uh, Sheriff Corona? <laughs> Sheriff Corona. Oh, yeah, that's the other big issue, of course. Always Republic. Not so much Republicans. You know, Ronald Reagan said Orange County is a place where all good Republicans go to die. And it's mostly die to see their political careers die because, you know, you have the Republican Party always just acting high and mighty and they're just falling and crashing and just so embarrassing. Yeah, our sheriff, he, and he looks kind of like Lee Baca. I've always thought that they were cousins, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, vaguely well, tell, tell the students in case they haven't heard about what happened with the sheriff of uh, Corona. Oh. Okay, so Sheriff Corona, he was called America's sheriff by no less an authority than Larry King. They were talking about him running for lieutenant government. He had the whole world in his hands just like six years ago. Unfortunately, he got connected with a you know, chain-smoking used car dealer and this, uh, a, you know, another cop named George Harmeo and Don Heidel. They, it's alleged now, I don't want to get sued, but it's alleged that oh, they, well, well no, 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 no. Like that'll stop you. Yeah, that'll stop me. So it's alleged that the three of them got into this uh, scheme that would enrich all of them. What's not alleged, what is real, is that Sheriff Corona cheated on his wife like crazy, followed reporters around in helicopters, and he called his penis the little sheriff. <laughs> OC Weekly weird. exclusive. We found that out. <laughs> yeah, very, very, very corrupt. So now, so now he's on trial. He's not, the no, trial. Tell who got indicted. Oh, no, yeah. Got indicted. Yeah, so Sheriff Corona got indicted on 10 felonies. They threw out, I think, two or three. So got indicted on seven felonies. He's trying to throw out the entire case. If all goes according to plan, uh, there'll be a uh, trial in, in uh, United States federal court in, you know, in Santa Ana in May, May or June around there. So it's going to be fun during the summer. 
Yeah, but also about uh, how he got indicted on the court with he, his wife, and his mistress. Oh, that's just the tawdry stuff. Yeah, there was this great image. <laughs> it's like Italy. Yeah, it's like It's, it's like, like they don't, they're the wife friends, and the mistress, they all hang out. Yeah, the, the, when they were in the courtroom, Corona was there, shackled. His wife was next to him, shackled. Right behind him was Corona's mistress, shackled. And both of their names, by the way, Debbie. He likes his Debbies. <laughs> He's a character, but he's, uh, he's facing corruption charges and, will probably, and was forced to resign. And he insisted for a while on staying in office, even though he was facing these indictments. And then finally, he, he succumbed to pressure to, to quit his job while he yeah. fought these charges. So but listening to you talk about Orange County, you said, what are the issues? Transportation, housing, gangs. It sounds like religion. immigration, religion. It sounds like LA. What is really the difference between today, Orange County and Los Angeles? What difference? A sense of yeah. idea. What's up? Gangs, maybe? Well, there's, well no. I, there are gangs in Orange County. Not, not as much. Not, much. not as much. I would say, honestly, LA, Orange County is where L.A. was around the 1950s. Because in L.A., that demographics change has already happened. I mean, Latinos became a majority a long time ago. L.A., you know, white L.A., the power structure, they had to deal with it. They fled to the valley or wherever they had to go. Orange County, we're finally dealing with it. We've been dealing with it for really the past 10 years, and it's going to come. So... I, I, I call Orange County really sort of the Ellis Island of the 21st century for the United States because whatever's going to happen in the United States, it's happening right now in Orange County where you have this demographics revolution, this clash between super rich, poor. Santa Ana, in 2004, in Orange County, mind you, Santa Ana, the, the county seat, was called by a university which did the study as the toughest place to live in in the United States. 15 minutes away from Santa Ana, you have a South Coast, no, seven, uh, 14 minutes away, South Coast Plaza, which is like the highest revenue mall in the United States where you could spend $30,000 on a pair of shoes and they sell out like crazy all the time. So, uh, so the turmoil, the troubles that LA went already, Orange County, we're just about to get into that phase. It's gonna be fun. Okay, we got only a couple more minutes to go, so I'm gonna try to open it up again to see uh, where's Tara with the, oh, okay. So uh, who's got a question? Okay, who's got? Um, I have a quick question for Gal um, first, and then a question for a Mexican. Um, <laughs> um, to Gal, um, how is your new show being um, funded that will make it different from the last one? Yeah. And um, then for uh, Gustavo, my question is um, you were talking about the changing demographics in Orange County and the difference, the, the sort of dichotomy between the super rich and, and the poor and the rising of the immigrant population um, and the Latino population. Um, I'm wondering um, if you think the older majority um, Republican voting um, majority white voters will um, be willing to invest in the rising Latino population um, for the future of the city. That's a, that's a great question. Okay, funding. Funding. Uh, we get most of our funding through foundations. That was true of Life and Times, and it will be, and it is becoming true of the new show. So we have a major grant from the Amundsen Foundation, and we also have Parsons. This is the Amundsen Auditorium. Yes, that we're yes. Um, you know, rich white people do do some good stuff, and I like them very much, especially when they give money for things, you know, like the show and the She's theater. Amazing. So we we have money from Amundsen, Parsons. I'm forgetting something. Um, a bit that is basically foundations. Very difficult to get corporate support for public local. Well, number one, it's harder to get support for local public sh affairs shows because you don't have the national audience that you can offer a, f a funder. You can only offer them, gee, you know, 12 million people instead of, you know, whatever, 30 million people. But also, um, it's harder to get corporate funds funders because they kind of often want to stay away from, you know, any kind of controversy or whatnot. Gustavo? But, but it's, so it's going to be foundation support. It was for Life and Times, and it will be also for the new show. Politicians are politicians. They're always going to have their own craven uh, needs to do whatever. I'll give you an exam two examples. City Placentia you know, had an all-Republican white city council. They tried to redevelop the downtown, which was historically Latino. And you know, through all the conflict of interest, all eminent domain, all that stuff, the voters, they just revolted, got, everyone, you know, got rid of everyone. There's one Latino on the city council, but you know, those people were much more in tune to what would be good for all Placentians as opposed to just the people in the city council. Now contrast, so you know, that represents the people in the voters in the city of Placentia really in tune to sort of the needs of everybody in Placentia. 
Now, contrast that to the city of Santa Ana. City of Santa Ana is the largest city in the United States with non-Latino city council. So, and you know, there was always these worries like, oh my gosh, if we're going to have all Latinos on the city council, they're only going to care about Latino issues or whatnot. No, no, no. Right now, and I, you know, I'm covering this as an investigative reporter, so I'm doing a lot of stories on this. But right now, the city of Santa Ana, these council members, they're taking thousands of dollars from developers. They're trying to create this new, you know, uh, what do you call it? Not a redevelopment plan, but they're saying, oh, we want to diversify the area. It's specifically downtown, which is 4th Street. A lot of Latino businesses, it's, re it's really code word for gentrification. Get those, you know, poor Mexican, you know, just not even just Mexican immigrants, but just get those poor people out of there and replace them with rich people. So my joke with that always is that, you know, before in Santa Ana, all across the United States, I would say, you used to have white politicians gentrifying Latinos. Now it's Latinos gentrifying Latinos, so that's improvement, right? You know, that's some sort of advancement. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, my question was for Val. What was the Latino community's involvement in the 1992 LA riots? Well, my, okay, this is just my opinion. I think they just, uh, a lot of them just jumped on the coattails of the black community and got a free TV out of a Circuit City. You know, I mean, I, when I, it's, in fact, one of the funniest things I ever saw, we have a Circuit City right across from KCT on Sunset Boulevard. And so the riots were happening and it was really bizarre. And I remember my office looked over Sunset Boulevard and I was watching, uh, you know, Circuit City and uh, all the whole parking lot was kind of this crazy maze of, of cars pulling in and out. And I'll never forget this, that, you know, those big posts that they have in front of the door so you can't go too far. Well, so the people, this one guy backed his pickup truck against the post, ran in and was bringing out like these big heavy, you know, boxes and his like pickup truck was getting all, you know, full and stuff and he had to keep running back in. Right? And he had like half full, he ran back in and before he could come back out with the next thing, another pickup truck came back, loaded the stuff from that pickup truck into oh. his, and took off. Now that to me is not somebody who's concerned about race relations. That, you know, I think in the end it just became a free for all. And I, I think a lot of Latinos who were not as close to the Rodney King issue, let's face it, they weren't, um, just, just took advantage of the chaos to, to get new stuff. And at the same time, you know, you also read some very encouraging stories within the next following week. You know, the, these, uh, little, you know, the, the Latina mothers, you know, don't you yet, that TV is, you know, very bad. You take Same. that back, it's going to be bad, bad luck, and you know, your grandfather's going to die early if you keep that TV. So a lot <laughs> of them, you know, point. really, it's true. A lot yeah. of, you know, the parents brought, they brought a lot of, you know, good families or whatever, did not let their uh, their kids keep that stuff. So it's, so, but, but, but I think clearly, in general. Clearly there was two phases to the riots, and this has been actually yes. uh, documented quite a bit. I yeah. mean, what, one of the statistics that's often shown is that there were more Latinos arrested than African Americans during the riots. But, but well, isn't that just a function of the demographics though? No, actually more? it was a function that the police didn't arrest anybody for the first two days. And the first ah, two days were really, it was a political riot. During the first two days, it was really something against the judicial system, the unfairness of what had occurred. By the second, late in the second day, third and fourth day, it was a bread riot. And people mm -hmm. thinking, hey, mm -hmm. society's breaking Free down. Stuff. You know, we're, we're, we're just what you, what you were talking about. So there were two distinct riots that happened uh, simultaneously. We have time for one more question, if anybody's got one. Anybody? No? Well, let, if you not, know. I'll, if I sure. could end on one thought. It's interesting because I was thinking about this, you know, Los Angeles and so forth, is knowing that I had to do this talk. And it's interesting because I, I never wanted to live in LA. I was born in Southern, or not born, I was born in Chicago actually, but lived in, in San Diego and had this, you know, oh, LA, avoid it, <laughs> try to get through it as quickly as possible, don't live there. Uh, never say never, guys, because here I am 20 years in Los Angeles and feeling very much like it is my home. So, but what I find so fascinating, I've always said, why is LA so fascinating? Because all these problems, and dystopia, and, uh, you know, all this, and the future doesn't look very good. Why is it so interesting? And I got the answer, interestingly enough, I was listening to an interview with a physicist and a theologian. And I thought he had, and he was talking about science. He was talking about <coughs> universes and stuff. But listen to what he said. He said, regions where real novelty occurs are regions where order and chaos meet, at the edge of chaos, where cloudiness and order interlace. If you are too much on the orderly side, nothing new happens. If you're too much on the haphazard side, nothing persists. Things just fall apart. So the borders are where the action is. And I think that's what makes LA so fascinating. And what you guys are gonna be doing in your future, and what I'm really excited about, is that all of you are bumping into borders constantly. Mm -hmm. Even if you live in an all white or all Latino or all black neighborhood, 
you're still bumping into borders. And what happens on those borders and the way you interact, the way you think of each other, and how you deal with those, that clash and that tension is really going to be what determines the future of Los Angeles. So, so I'm optimistic uh, in yeah, that respect. Yeah. And I think that's part of the theme of the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles here at Loyola Marymount University in our urban lecture series. So I want to thank you and let's thank our guests. Thank guest. you. Thank you so much. And we will see you guys next time. Till then, take care.